Coming up next, one of the greatest living guitarists tells us the story of his band's biggest hit. He believed in it so much, he almost quit the band in protest. The label didn't want to release the song as a single because there was nothing on radio like it at the time. Usually that's a good thing. It was the time of, you know, big explosive power ballads. And this song was more like a Beatles song. It's kind of mellow. But he knew it was something special. So he fought for it. He was right as it became one of the biggest songs ever. It's telling the story coming up next on Professor Rock. Hey, music junkies, Professor of Rock, always here to celebrate the greatest artists and the greatest songs of all time. You know, if you can name every member of the Brat Pack and the Rat Pack, you're gonna dig this channel of musical memories, nostalgia all the time. Make sure that you subscribe below right now so you always get our latest interviews and stories. Click the bell, all that jazz. Also, check us out on Patreon. Uh, that's below where you can get even more content, more interviews, and uh, our latest merch that helps us keep it a daily channel. So I'm excited to bring you yet another episode from our series, Revelations, our most popular one on here. It's where featured artists go deep on their greatest albums and songs. Insight you won't find anywhere else. Today, we're going all in with one of the greatest guitarists of the rock era. He came of age as the 80s were ending and the 90s were beginning with an acoustic song that dominated radio. Talking about Nuno Betancourt of the band Extreme and their biggest hit, More Than Words. More than words is all. Coming up next, Nuno is going to tell us how the song was born. And he knew it was something special, even though the record label, they just wouldn't support it. They said because it just didn't sound like anything on the radio at the time. You know, this is with the big power ballads, dance pop. Whereas this song sounded more like the Everly Brothers or the Beatles, a lot more mellower. Uh, he also tells us the band's new music, including his unbelievable playing on the new song, Rise. As we get into this interview, I do want to thank our sponsor, Zenny Eyewear, the glasses that I always wear. Over 50 million pairs sold and a 30-day peace of mind return. Plus, you get to design your own pair, the color, the shape, the style. Zenny is the only way to go. Add to that the fact that you can get a complete pair of prescription eyewear for up to 80% off regular retail prices. It's a no-brainer. Click on the info button right up here and you'll get our special pricing. Here's Nuno Betancourt. You believe in more than words. Number one monster hit that, I mean, 32 years later, still huge. We're still talking about it. Kids, it's multi, multi, multi-generational. Kids are still singing this song. They're playing it. I actually argue that for my dad, he was trying to learn, my dad, his friends, they were trying to learn Stairway to Heaven. Kids my age were trying to learn more than words. And that's so cool that Zeppelin was your inspiration. It frustrated just the fact that they had to play percussion at the same time. It annoyed the shit out of it. He's like, why did you have to throw that in there? It's an easy song to play. And you have to find bone and you have to play like percussion while you do it. It always comes across this story. I, I don't tell it much and I stopped telling it because it makes it sound like A&M didn't support us and they didn't get us. They signed us for a reason and they love porn and graffiti and I believe that they love more than words. What I think happens sometimes is that this fear comes in when, not, when things haven't been done and labels uh, tend to follow if a Guns and Roses comes out. Okay, we got a player at the table, get all that hair metal stuff out, get a little dirty. <laughs> Less this, less spandex. Let's go for like Guns N' Roses. Let's get gritty. And then they find a bunch of Guns N' Roses and then a bunch come out. And then, and then Seattle happens and we got to go find a bunch of sound gardens. Like they chase. I get it. It's they're, they're in the business of like dishing out a lot of money to make it back. But sometimes record companies, most of the time, at least, at least pre nineties or pre 2000, let's say they signed bands of the love of, they looked for bands that, were different and something that could be proud of. They weren't chasing all the time. I mean, I was in a record company, a &M, which my God had Sting, the police, Soundgarden, Sheryl Crow, Janet Jackson, uh, Carpenters. I mean, the list went on and on and on of bands that we loved. And I was so proud to be there. They were a boutique 
label, the biggest boutique label ever. And you could walk on that lot and they were like creative and it just felt home. felt like a, it was a place where an artist could hang their hat. So when I say that story about more than words, I think it was one of those things where you, people have to remember, there was no MTV Unplugged at the time. And the last time an acoustic song with two guys sitting down playing a folk song like that. Blackbird singing in the dead of night. And singing like a Beatlesque Blackbird or or a Everly Brothers. It was like Everly Brothers esque. I'll do my crying in the rain. Or or even uh Handyman. Yeah, James Taylor. Last time we heard James Taylor stuff was like 70s, right? Late 70s on the radio, except for like obviously adult contemporary stuff that's still playing that stuff, classic rock. But pop radio, rock radio, hell no. So we were always of the mind, let's run into that burning building because nobody's done it, where everybody's like, well, wait a second, where do we put this thing? What format is this? Rock radio is not going to play this. But one thing we knew is the fans were telling us, we were on tour with Alice in Chains and we were playing and it was the first time me and Gary started playing more than words and we couldn't get a word out. The club was singing it. Well, I said the club, maybe there was 20 people in there at the time, but they were singing it. That was telling us it was connecting. It was the best marketing, you know, the best kind of test marketing you could do. And, but when we were going back to the label, cause they weren't out there, they were like, yeah, we don't know. We we're like, no, it, it's, it's, you know, it, we always thought it was a hit, but you got to remember the reason, think about this, you're a record company and you're listening to this song and you love the song, but you're not thinking about it emotionally and how it's touching people. You're thinking about it as a hit and you're going, this is not a hit. My manager said it wasn't a hit. I think even a couple of guys in my band said it wasn't a hit, maybe because they weren't playing on it, but that's a whole other story. <laughs> my point being is that it really wasn't a hit written like a hit. Where is the big book? There's no chorus. There was no chorus. It was just two of us like rambling, playing, you know, some harmonies. I remember writing it on a porch. Then we go into another section. It's a little bit more harmony. Then the chorus was more harmonies. And it never really got to the chorus. It never like we said more than words in it, but it just gone. And it went, it went. More than words to show you feel. But what I realized, the biggest lesson was this, is every hit song has to touch somebody emotionally. Whether it's more than words, or whether it's a Beatles song, it's an anthem for something. It touches you for a party. Van Halen touched you on go party and break everything and go. ACDC was like arenas and your fists up and that the space they did, it touched you emotionally. It made you want to do something. It was a soundtrack to your life somehow. So I think that was trying to figure out and navigate for a record company to go, where do we put this? Well, it was such a different kind of love song that was on the radio because everything was power ballads. Oh, and ballads everywhere. Def Leppard, every great songs, but I was like, I want to know what love is like. It's all massive songs. So all of a sudden these guys are, <laughs> you know, playing like, playing what? Acoustic guitar? Like what? And the video was iconic in that way as well because it was black and white, very simple. People were making, you know, $250,000 videos and they wanted to put us on a mountaintop with like, you know, helicopters and shit. I'm like, no, no, no. Let's play the song like we play the song. And and that's what we did. My heart was too. Yeah, and I was like, look, if you guys aren't putting this out, why do I want to do this again? Why do I want to do it? We had a six album deal. Why would I want to keep going? So we have this fight every time of like not putting out what we are because we're afraid or we're not sure. We're like, do it because we're not sure. Let's, why follow everybody? Why not break that mold? And I remember uh, MTV wanting us to come on and perform in front of some people sitting around and they wanted us to do the acoustic stuff. And I was like, well, that's great, but I don't want everybody to perceive that we're just an acoustic band. And we're going to do those two singles. Can we play our rock stuff as well in an acoustic format? Hmm. I'm not saying we invented MTV and plug, but let me tell you something. I think we definitely, I think we definitely sparked something. And the part that pissed me off the most about that story is that we never got asked to come back and do MTV Unplug. And we were almost like the quintessential band that was like, should have done it. Right. You kind of inadvertently 
may have planted that idea. Yeah, maybe, you know, and, and it would have been nice, you know, but you know how it is. It's like sometimes nothing was easy for us because of our sound, because we were from Boston and all the metal bands from West Coast. Uh, it was always, we were a little bit of an odd, odd man out. And we, but we embraced that. We loved it. We, we saw our heroes like that. We, we noticed that Zeppelin from one song to the next was like, what sometimes? Like, where are you taking us? Same thing happened to Zeppelin when they released Zeppelin three, the critics tore them apart. Zeppelin three is one of my favorite Zepp albums. And I, I stole so much from there acoustically. I told, got to tell Paige that. And he was like, really? Zip? Like, dude, it's iconic because they know they got, they got the shit kicked out of him because they wanted to do something not as heavy. Exactly. But it's a really important Zeppelin album. I love the imagery of the story. You and Gary sitting on the porch. You start strumming something. Gary runs into the house and hurries and writes down more than words is all you have to do. Yeah, we wrote that in like 20 minutes, man. It was crazy. Is all and then recorded on a four track, you laid it down. And it's cool because it's, it's a love song that it's a lot deeper because the, the singer wants his lover to do more to prove her love other than saying the phrase, I love you. And so it was more of a, of a way to think about the words that were being said in the, just your traditional love song. If I took those words away. Yeah, it was cool because you're right. Everything's like, you know, I love you. I want to know. I love this was like, you know, saying I love you, like, it's like, I love my dog. I love this ice cream. You know, you, it's like, Eddie, show me how much you love me. And as simple as that was, you know, I, I, I have a term I use that I'm a high school dropout, but I had to come up with a term to explain hits and well-written songs that connect with people. And pop songs, R&B songs, reggae songs, every genre of rock and roll has been the same arrangement since the beginning of time. It still is. It's like a verse, chorus, verse, chorus. You got a bit of a bridge. Maybe a solo if the guitar player is any good. You do an out chorus, you go home. I mean, it's really the same still to this day. And it's simple. And I always equated it as like nursery rhymes for adults. If you really think about it, it's the same arrangement as nursery rhymes were singing to kids. It's no different than, you know, five monkeys, you know, jumping on the bed to London bridges falling down to like to uh, twinkle, twinkle, little star. But they're for adults. That's simple. And you can do that. And a lot of pop is that simple. You like it, you might sing along, but it goes on its way. Then you add another element to it that the great band's at, and it's simplexity. So I call it, you add the complex layers, and we got simplexity. That's the word you need. Meaning, listen to a queen or a zeppelin. It's still like, you know, kill a queen is like, you know, three and a half minutes, but please, you put your headphones on, and you rediscover it and discover it and rediscover it again. She's a killer, queen, got body, gender, teen, and, and that's what Queen did. That's what Zeppelin did. That's what Radiohead does. That's what all these great bands that give up about their music and our artists. Yeah, these are these are songs that were written in an artistic way that they weren't sitting there and going like, oh, let's write a hit for the radio or for anybody else. They were sitting there, great musicians, great chemistry, doing things. Then you were I love the story about your sister when you went back home after you guys had put it put it down. Yeah, look, my sister Fatima, you know, she's always loved good music and she's always like, yeah, it's the Beatles and it's this and she's she's a little bit of a snob musically. Only the best, the best, the best, the best. I remember she's never really commented much on any of my music that way. I mean, proud but not commented. And I remember I was sitting there and she just walked by and she's like, and I'm just kind of playing it off the four track and I'm just like, debating what to do with it, what is, what is it? And she just goes, what is that? And I was like, what do you care? You're going to tell me it sucks anyways. And she was like, no, that's you? That's you guys? And the first thing she said wasn't even like, oh my God, I love this song. She goes, you better protect that song. Like, don't let anybody, you know, I'm like, what, what, are you A&R now? What are you in the music business? Like, she goes, no, somebody's going to steal that. That's a big song. That's a really great. And then she just walked away. And, I'm like, and nobody else, like the late, nobody else thought it, but like, like what the hell? My sister caught it. And that's the, that's that test marketing that you want. And she was like, that, that's a hit. That's a smash. It was her and one of the only few other people later in life, I'll never forget. We're in the studio. We were at Scream Studios in the Valley. 
pointing back there because the valley's right behind me, the Hollywood sign. And Sebastian Bach, early days, Sebastian Bach, comes in, just, you know, big, they just broke, and he comes in to visit us. And he's in there and listening to the tracks, and then more than words, and I'm thinking, this guy's gonna go. He literally went, he stopped, and he's like, and I thought he was gonna go like, really guys, really? And he stopped. He just listened to the whole thing, he was like, that's a smash. It's gonna be your biggest song ever. And I'm like, Sebastian. To the point where he's like, he was so excited that he's like, I would even quit my band right now to manage you guys to make sure like that, that's gotta be on the, that's gonna be the biggest song ever. He knew before everybody else in the business. Well, you called up the president of the label. I mean, that's pretty awesome. That's how much that, uh, that you believed in it. Al Kafar is the president of the label, most incredible human being, super smart. Loved extreme, supported extreme. Obviously, we had dude, we had the A and M of A and M. We had Herb Albert jamming with Herb Albert in A and M studios while he was playing. Me and him with a drum machine, like that's the relationship you had in there. You're with the A of A and M, and also Moss would come in and doing video shoots. And he was the guy. I mean, wow, this is A and M of A and M. Like it was a real boutique lot. The old Chaplin lot still there. It's now Henson. But, you know, the question that I remember having a great conversation with Al was, all right, let me get this straight. You guys went into a meeting, you have A&R department marketing everybody there. And they're going to tell us that we don't think it's a single, we don't think it's a hit. Fair enough. Why? Because it's opinion anyways. It, but what I said to him was this. I said, let me ask you a question. We're on A&M and you got Janet. You're making decisions on Janet. You're making decisions on the Neville brothers. You're making decisions on Sarah, all these amazing, iconic artists. If I wasn't on this label, Extreme wasn't on this label, and you heard us on the radio, would you buy my album? Would any of those guys buy our albums? They didn't sign us. They're just, just the team that gets assigned to this. So, and he paused. He's like, I see your point. But I said, you're making our decisions for future of our career and you might not even be a fan. You might not even like, like what we do. It's just the next thing on the slot that's coming out and you're putting your finger up and, and, and asking people and they're like, of course they're going to say more than words, where the you put that. So I think, you know, then they were like, okay, let's test market in, in two markets. And when they did that, I didn't even know what that was. I thought they were just shutting me up. But then I remember my manager called me and saying, hey, they, they, they test marketed in like, I want to say New Mexico or something like that. Thanks, guys. Not even New York or LA. New Mexico. And like, you know, they have the, it was the station that had top seven at seven. Maybe it was, I think Denver was the second one because then they wanted to check it twice. But the interesting thing was that I didn't know you could pay, pay to do everything back then on the radio, but you pay somebody to play the song three times a day, three, four times a day to get numbers to test market for the label. And they added on Tuesday and the first day on Tuesday, that Tuesday, it was number seven at seven. Wednesday hired by Friday, it was number one in a week. More than is all you it's not me patting myself on the back of the band. It's saying my theory was correct. Give them something fresh where they go, what that? Break the mold. Don't just go with the format, like give them something and everybody was like, yes, we're tired of all the power ballad shit. Give us something that's organic and is soulful and is right in our faces and all that stuff connects with us. What would you say? And then they tested another one, the same thing happened. And then we were flying back to do that video over here at AM, where I can see from my house as well. It had to be the ultimate vindication when it started to move up. What did you think when it when it hit number one? And of course, you guys didn't get the actually experienced some of that craziness because you're on tour yeah what was crazy is we kind of missed out and i'm a little still i'm like i'm glad it happened but i'm still upset that it happened this way we had no internet we had no cell phones at that time 91 really they're just starting to come into play but you know more mid 90s we leave for europe uk and we you know you, you get on a hotel phone and you call home any chance you get, but you realize that you spent $400 on one hotel phone call home. And your brother and stuff is telling, guys, dude, you're not gonna believe this. I'm like, what? He goes, your song's on the radio, it's everywhere. And then you call a week later, it's like, dude, you're on MTV. 
you're like top 10 of 10. Like, what? The video, everything, we're like, we're missing it all. And then I remember being in my hotel room and getting a phone call at three in the morning. And my manager said, hey, uh, I wanted to call you. I know it's late. And I wanted to tell you something, some news. I go, what? He goes, Billboard called. More Than Words will be number one tomorrow. And I was like, what? It was so confusing because we missed it all. We missed it at 40. We missed it at 30. We missed it. And it was exciting, but it was so bizarre because... My family's saying, you walk into Walmart, we can hear it. You, there's people camping out in front of your house, my mom is telling me. I'm like, what's going on? And we're in the UK. And get the funk out is breaking in the UK. Not more than one. And then we got back and then it went to number one. And I remember running down and banging on the doors of the band and in our underwear and shit. And dude, number one, we have to hit. We wrote this little song we wrote, Malden Mass, on the porch and... That's it. Believed in it. No plan, marketing plan, nothing. Just, and it really taught us a lesson that, you know, do what you love to do. And when the two can come together, I mean, what, what magic? Dude, you got to tell us the Steven Tyler story, though. I'll tell you about that. It was interesting because it's it, it's a bad period in our lives. And I don't think it was just because of the more than we were being told we we're the more than words. Guys, the band, we were having turmoil within the band. We were like rebellious and you and this and we're opening for Aerosmith. And you know what? F everybody. We're not going to even do more than words in the set. Here we are. We never played some of these Eastern Bloc countries, these Eastern countries for, I don't know, never. And we're finally going and they love extreme. And then we don't play more than once. And we didn't do it. For, we didn't do it for like, honest to God, the tour. We're so angry and we're so depressed and we're so hating on each other that we're going to punish ourselves. And then punish the fans as well. Punish everybody. Everybody's going down with us. And then we get to the, the polling gig after the, after the polling gig. We get to our dressing room and there's a Sharpie on the wall in big letters like, play the song. And we're like, put that out there and we're like, oh my God, it can only be one person. And he should have signed it. Yeah, ow, you know, maybe he should have signed it like that and we would have known. But it was Steven. It was one of his favorite songs of all time. Still talks about song. He asked me to perform it with him at the Nobel Peace Prize. That's how much he loves the song. I played it with him countless times already. But he was like, really? Really, guys? Play the song. Steven Tyler tells you to play the song, you play the song. It was right back in the Well, I love this. Since then, though, you, you've said in interviews, you don't take a single performance of that song for granted. It's because no. it's not a song anymore. Like you've said, it's a moment. Because what you realize, what you realize then is that you write these songs, you finish them off, and the day, like Rise was out and this album is out now, June 9th, this shit is no, no longer ours. It's theirs. <laughs> fans and it's like 12 children that you were raising and you, you put out into the world and you got you got them where you needed them and you were proud of them and you got to let them go weird al deconstructed the video anyway with his song and then jack black and jimmy fallon what do you think of some of those takes <laughs> well you know it's funny people call you and go like oh my god you see what these guys did and make it funny you're like what are you kidding me that's the best form of flattery anybody the way al does anything I wish he had done more than words of song. He did the video. It was funny. You shaved off my eyebrows while I was asleep. But I would have loved to see what he would have done with more than words. But uh, but he's an icon. When I saw the Jimmy Fallon Jack Black thing, I I loved it, man. Now that I've tried to talk. It's, it was an honor. That shit is an honor. When somebody picks your song, two icons like that, and they love your song enough to do a parody. That's the ultimate thank you and, and, and gratitude that like, man, your song affected us that much that, and I remember talking to Jack Black about it. He's like, dude, Jimmy loves you guys. And he loves that song. And when he said to do it, he goes, I was obviously a fan, but he wanted to do it exactly like the video and everything else. He goes like, that was all him. He was obsessed. I'm like, that's awesome. Hey, thanks so much for watching. Leave us a comment about Nuno and extreme and this all-time classic song 
Also, their new music. What do you think about that? We'll uh, link to it below so you can get that. What are your memories of this song and this band? Are you going to check them out? They're out on tour right now. Let us know about the new music. Let's have a great discussion below. To get more of this interview and many others, make sure to click on our Patreon link below. If this content resonates with you, make sure to subscribe below. We'd love to have you as part of our community. Until next time, three chords and the truth, my friends. Thank you.